Northern Journey is described on its Steam page as being a Norwegian happy sad game, and even though I really had no understanding of what that could mean, I decided to gamble on this one because I really liked the environments shown in the store screenshots, and the reviews were almost nothing but high praise. But as you will soon find out like I did, happy sad is very accurate. Despite its retro looking art style, Northern Journey is not a boomer shooter. It is a linear first person story game with no bloat, grind, or side quests. It has fantastic sights to show you, some awe-inspiring and wonderful, and some that are more in line with nightmares. And despite sounding like an American pharmaceutical commercial, if you have a fear of heights, spiders, or insects, deep water tight spaces, or ghosts, this game might not be for you. The game is all from the mind of a true solo developer, and in the credits he thanks his friends and family. On his YouTube channel, he documents the development of the game using real life plants as textures and incorporating his love of hiking, diving, and medieval weapons into core elements of the game. Northern Journey is a true passion project and it shows. And unlike many indie titles, this game isn't a half hour romp. It's a proper journey that took me almost 13 hours to complete. It's complete with varied combat, some encounters slow paced requiring precise aiming, and some fast paced requiring circle strafing. There is also a hefty amount of world building, strange creatures, interactions, puzzles, and everything else. This is the very first game by indie developer Slid Studio. Considering that, the ambition and scale of it all is very impressive. At first blush, this game made me think that it was very Dark Souls inspired. Not in gameplay, but in its environmental design and how everything you can look at, you can travel to. The world seems a maze in many ways, and solving one area or puzzle may open a shortcut to a previous place. The more I played, however, the more it made me think of Skyrim with its long wandering sections. And while it has many signs of being a solo project, it gets so much right and comes with an incredible atmosphere. Just like the screenshots that attracted me to this game, Game, the environments don't disappoint and are easily the best part about this game. The vista views, the scale, the atmosphere, and in some cases, a feeling of dread. One Steam reviewer said it best with, I can't remember playing a game that made me this nostalgic for that unique fear of the unknown that kids feel. And yeah, that is definitely an accurate way of describing how this game made me feel as well. One of the challenges I face as a reviewer is creating a video that tells the viewer just enough, but not too much that it spoils so much of the journey. And in this case, the story is very straightforward, and I think it's best to just touch on the surface of it, because I think that this is a game that you should be experiencing for yourself. So, you're an unnamed traveler who is rowing through misty fjords unknown, and you've become lost. As you pass a lighthouse, some kind of mystical sniper shoots holes in your boat from the cliffside. You barely make it to the shore before sinking, and you're now stranded. After a short hike up a stunningly pretty hill, you meet a traveling flute player who finds it extremely convenient. You're now trapped here, and of course she'll help you if you retrieve some of her lost items. Once you venture to the nearby village, you get the first taste of this mysterious northern world. The first person you meet is a pantsless village idiot, his pet worm monster, and a very angry sheriff's dog. And if that's not strange enough, you then visit the sheriff, and he's preoccupied with an actual demon in his little jail Cell, and he seems to think it's a nice old lady, so I'm not sure who the actual village idiot is here. It's safe to say there's something off and strange about everyone in town, and it adds to the whimsical mystery of this game. Like these little guys that are just casually running around the church's courtyard digging into the ground and popping back up. In his developer video, Slid mentioned how he was inspired by the strange characters of Banjo-Kazooie, of all games. Even Banjo-Kazooie has a certain influence with its silly characters in a mysterious world. And I can kind of see that here for sure. And while you'll need to come back to town a few times, sometimes just to see the town doctor, your main goal is to venture north, where you'll have run-ins with a lot of different interesting characters, as you are now forced into the flute player's employ to find her missing items. You'll get lost sometimes, it is a journey after all, but it's the fun kind of lost, and the game is pretty linear, so you're never really lost for very long. The flute player's messengers will show up often enough, updating your journal with tasks and keeping things on track. And it's about as simple as that. 
Follow the path, complete the journal, and then complete your journey. Graphically, the game is on the low end and it runs fast with no frame drop or performance issues. Like I said earlier, the environments look realistic and beautiful despite the retro style due to the use of real life pictures of plants as textures. The character models are very rudimentary and polygonal, possibly made to look like a game like Banjo Kazooie. And while it does look admittedly amateurish, it does give the game a unique, surreal art direction that I think does add to the overall experience. It kind of reminded me of games like Outer Wilds or Pathologic. And while I don't wish the game had realistic looking characters, I guess I will be honest and say I wish they had a little bit more fidelity to them. The same goes for some of the animations as everything was a bit floaty in this game. It worked very well for the bugs and flying creatures, but it just didn't really fit the humanoid characters in my opinion. Speaking about bugs, it's obvious Slid was right at home modeling bugs and spiders. The models and animations were fantastic and hopefully you're not afraid of the creepy crawlies but more on that in a minute. The game is low fidelity, but it doesn't come across as trying to emulate a retro game. I would not have guessed this game was made with Unreal Engine 4, and while that seems like too powerful of an engine for a visually simple game like this, Northern Journey does feel like a fully realized world, and it's good at conveying a lot with very little, and it uses the power it has to give you an incredible sense of scale. And like I said earlier, just like in Dark Souls, sometimes there is a faraway scenery you can never touch, but you can still touch a good amount of it. And looking around, wherever you see a rope or a bridge, that is somewhere you can get to. And when you finally unlock the zip line for the ropes, that is when you can really appreciate just how much more there is to this world. And it does give you that great sense of discovery. I appreciate just how very well thought out these levels are. These are not haphazard, windy mazes that leave you lost and frustrated. Yes, there are moments when you get turned around, but the beauty of the design is that it's still open and branched out enough that it gives you a lot to to find and ways of returning to where you were when you got turned around. It is so clearly made by someone who loves hiking and exploring and despises insects. This game is chock full of them. There are well over 50 enemies in this game and I'm pretty sure that over 80% of them are bugs. And don't get me started on the spiders. If you have arachnophobia, yeah, look away. Not just one kind of spider, but every spider. Even so, with all the bugs and spiders, fighting the same general kind of enemy doesn't feel repetitive. The spiders aren't actually just a color swap. They have different models and they move and fight in different ways. And a bunch of effort has gone into making them visually distinct. You've got your jumping spiders, your daddy long leg spiders, ambushing spiders, spiders that dodge arrows, and even undead skeleton spiders. And as you might expect, the game draws a lot from Nordic folklore as well. But I appreciated how this folklore was not straight up horror or way too otherworldly. It actually kind of felt rooted in reality and it just made sense. It felt more old and fairy tale like, whimsical and bizarre. And it pushed the narrative forward, but it wasn't over the top. And it made the game curiously engaging to the point where you wanted to inhabit this world and venture forward to see where everything would go next. One strong critique I have is that you interact with this world with your hands and they're just kind kind of floating there, like a VR game. There is actually no player model and it feels weird. It really broke my immersion at the start of the experience and it took me some time before I got over it. Sure, I stopped noticing it in time, but I would be lying if I said it didn't bother me at the start of the game. So visually, it has grand scale folklore, mystery, and a retro art direction blended with real life elements. An interesting mix that works. However, what ties it all together and brings the atmosphere to the next level is the game's music. The tracks in this game are delicious, eerie, and sometimes downright haunting. Just the act of entering some new area will stick with me a long time, purely due to the music. And I am a strong believer that without a soundtrack as good as this, this game would not be as nearly as good or special. The music makes you feel like you're in this world. You feel the traditional northern music mixed with a whimsical fairy tale. Just listen for yourself.
There is a solid variety of tracks, and they all perfectly reflect the areas they were made for. As a bonus, the soundtrack is included with the game as well. And while the music is next level, the sound design is also fantastic. Walking around, you'll hear the layered sound of the wind through the trees and the grass, and the overlapping rush of water. Putting it all together, the act of just walking around feels otherworldly. For example, there is one area where you need to skirt the edge of a pond, and while you're doing this, a creature is trying to lure you to it. So you have to fight and push against its movement. There's a creature in the lake trying to drag you to your doom and its serenading calls mix in with the music. It creates a really eerie and interesting experience. Northern Journey has some of the best atmosphere I've seen in a game, which is an insane accomplishment for a solo developer and their very first project to boot. And speaking about atmosphere, I think this is a good section to talk about the underwater areas of this game. Now while it was a very minor part of the game, there were some areas that were incredibly creepy and incredibly atmospheric, all taking place underwater. And it gave the game a little bit of variety and a switch up and it just was very interesting and cool to me and I thought it was really well done. And again, if you're claustrophobic, you probably don't want to play this one. From the Steam page, without reading reviews, someone might think, oh, this is a walking sim. But I would not be reviewing the game for this channel if there was not combat. You can sprint, there's no stamina meter, and you can play this game at near quake-like speeds. Or maybe I should say Hexen-like speeds, as Slid mentioned Hexen as one of his chief inspirations. Hexen, a 90s game. It is a dark fantasy FPS I played a lot. It is the mood, aesthetics and music of the game I really like. There are moments where you can circle strafe, but the aiming requires more precision than other fast-paced shooters due to the nature of the slow, single-shot reloading weapons. This can make combat needlessly difficult at times, but once you find your flow, for lack of a better term, you can overcome the fights. However, I do have to say I don't feel the weapon speeds gel very well with the combat pacing at times, and that was for sure a rare negative moment for me in this otherwise near-perfect game. Like for example, when you're fighting 50 naked four horsemen chasing you in a tight combat space and all you have is a single shot weapon that takes seconds to reload, it feels off. Some areas alleviate this by giving you a special weapon, like a sheep staff that fires bolts while the head slowly melts away. That was pretty cool and made the combat feel fun and rewarding, especially because you have to balance on these beams and if you don't and you fall into the water, you die. It's a good solution, but not every fight has one. And in these regular encounters, there can be a healthy amount of jank, like enemies phasing through the ground or weird hitboxes, strange animations that feel floaty and buggy. My personal theory is that the developer did not know how to rig a model, so instead he used vertex animation or blend shapes. And while I have no proof of this, that's just how it felt to me. Either way, it feels strange, but honestly, I didn't mind it because the whole world is surreal. But if you do, it could be a game breaker for you. You can carry multiple weapons on you, but you can only select four to quickly switch between. The only upgrades in this game are little red vials you find that permanently upgrade your health by a tick, and orange vials that permanently increase your ammo capacity and how many emergencies emergency health potions you can hold on you. The purple emergency potions are for use in a bind, otherwise you'll find green health vials lying around. Ammo is also scattered about as well and you usually have to search for it. All in all, the system's very simple. The last stretch of the game felt a bit rushed if I'm being honest. It lacked the rewarding exploration and care and design the rest of the game had. It goes full retro FPS with items everywhere where before they were placed with care. There's also a multiple stage end boss fight and while combat was definitely a big part of the game, it's not really the strength of the game, so a pure combat climax for this game just didn't really work for me. And while these issues were not enough to ruin the overall experience, I would say that they stacked up enough to make it feel more flawed by the end. And it did give me the sense that Slid may have felt developer burnout crafting such a brilliant game that he just felt the desire to get it done as he slapped the final sections together. But again, I have no proof of this, I'm just reading through the lines based off my experience with the game. Yet still, a weak ending to this game is not a fatal flaw. Remember, as a reviewer, I oftentimes look too deep into things, and an area I might have found unenjoyable, others may just not worry about. And you know what? Unenjoyable is too strong of a word. 
I would just say different. It just was inconsistent with the rest of the game. Others may not even worry about it. This was a game I had to look for issues with because up until the final areas, the entire game was practically a masterpiece. Honestly, it is one of the best games I've played in years and I may just put it in my top 10 best single player FPS games of all time. It was that good. I've been thinking about playing it again and I just finished it. I don't do that sort of thing. Even with the jank and the underwhelming end, the atmosphere, the lore, the world building, exploration, and music more than make up for it. It has overwhelmingly positive reviews on Steam and I can see why. This is an absolutely easy recommend. Go play it now. If you've played Northern Journey and you've enjoyed it, please share with us your thoughts in the comments below. And if you go out and play it and if you do enjoy it, please go leave a positive review of it on Steam or anywhere else it goes. That just helps a ton with visibility, and this is the exact kind of game that deserves it. We need more games like this, and I'm eagerly awaiting Slid's next release as I've heard he's working on something new. Please be sure to like this video if you enjoyed it, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks for watching, I'm Salty Octopus, and I will see you next time. Happy fragging.